Okay, schauen wir mal. All right, we start. Okay. In the apartheid era, what was the value of the support of the international solidarity support provided to African National Congress and to the many South Africans in exile? Well, the, that was a great value. The support that we received internationally was of great value. And in fact, we have as the ANC and the government and the people of South Africa consistently been saying we could not have achieved our liberation without the international solidarity we received. In our pillars of struggle, we had four pillars of struggle. The first one was the masses of our people, what they were doing in resistance in South Africa. The second pillar was the underground struggles. The third pillar was Um Kondoesis were an armed struggle. And the fourth and very important pillar was the international struggle because the three pillars I've talked about depended on the fourth pillar. Whether it was the underground, we depended on uh, solidarity and support, financial, material and otherwise. And in that tone, we can also say many a person in the international community, the, soli the solidarity that they gave, lost their lives and others had a very difficult time because of their support to South Africa. And therefore that value is what we talk about today. And I should also say, it's one of the things that we have to consistently thank the international community, but above all, teach our children about solidarity and internationalism. Because in the world over today, you still have injustice. And for us, as a world progressive community, to win, we have to be in solidarity with each other. Um, what does the character of Oliver Tambo represent for South Africa, and what is the legacy he left? O.R. Tambo, I knew him personally. One of the things that I loved about him before I get to the values is just his humility. If at all you met him, you would not know that there was, this was the president of the African National Congress, that he had suffered so much, but above all, that he was doing so much. His integrity, he taught us integrity. His selflessness and the notions of what is in it for me, I and myself, did not exist. Whatever he did, he did it for the people, for the masses, for our country. His commitment, his passion. One of the things he once said to me is that uh, you are not likely to go far in anything that you do if you're not passionate about it. You can struggle, if you're just struggling because there's oppression and you're not passionate, that's fine. But passion drives us. So you're talking about integrity, you're talking about commitment, you're talking about humility, you're talking about passion, you're talking about service. All these things are an embodiment of O.R. Tamo. These are the things that actually defined the ANC. That all of us who were members and cadres of the ANC were there not for our own benefits, but for the benefit of the good. When he addressed us, we used to love him because he didn't say cadre. He says the cadres of the African National Congress. And the cadres of the African National Congress had to be different from anybody else. So if you were a cadre, you were different. You were supposed to be different because of these defining values. These are the values that today we're trying to teach our children, not only in South Africa, but the world over. But unfortunately, these are the values that sometimes we're losing in South Africa because the value of service, the value of selflessness, and the value of putting people first, but to be, as we say, they are beginning to diminish amongst us in South Africa, where we begin to look at our own personal and sometimes selfish interests over the interests of the masses. Okay. How were and how did uh, change the relations uh, between African countries and the countries of Southern Africa. Uh, the dialogue that Radio Media had uh, in the 70s was with the entire Southern African territory. 
uh, t- today it must continue with more countries or did anything change in this regard? What type of relations exist nowadays with the countries of Southern Africa? First and foremost, the countries of Southern Africa were the last ones, well, almost the last ones to be liberated. And therefore, there was a lot of solidarity amongst themselves because it was the liberation movement. Whether you were talking about Swapo in Namibia, Frelimo in, 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 uh, in Mozambique, uh, Zebra and others in, 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 in uh, Zimbabwe. So we were a group of Southerners and most of us were in exile. In fact, some of the Namibians that I now know today, I met outside uh, in the different uh, uh, countries where we were as exiles. But secondly, we were supported by Africa, all of us, not a single one of us did not receive a support from Africa, from the African countries. And of course, these differed one country from the other, but generally. And the OAU recognized these liberation movements and pledged support MPLA and all of us. So we depended first and foremost on Africa. But secondly, we also depended on what I talked about earlier on, the international solidarity. And we got free one by one. So each time one got free, then continued to support the others. Once the others got free, they still receive support from the international community, from Africa. However, they had now a role to play with South Africa. But they were also then now the victims. Because whereas South Africa used to go up to Zambia to go and try to seek us out or to London, now we were around. We were in Mozambique, we were in Zimbabwe, we were in all these places. So their people, after liberation, suffered even more sometimes than before liberation. Because now there were free countries ready for reconstructions in their own countries. But they couldn't because then they were harboring us. And we have many a grave of the nationals. Whether you talk about what happened in Lesotho, in Botswana, there's not a single country in Southern Africa that does not have some massacre or another. And these are the massacres that were anti-apartheid massacres. So that relationship was very strong between ourselves, amongst ourselves as Southern Africa. And we were called at that time, we called them what we call the frontline states because they were in the front line of the war against South Africa. Then once South Africa got free and we were integrated into the world. The OAU, we participated, and the OAU changed to the AU. We also played a critical role again as South Africa because of our democracy and how we had achieved this, and because we also understood, probably even more than other countries, the importance of peace as a condition for development in any particular country. Now, in terms of internationally, you will then find that, for instance, Radio Emilia first has relations with Mozambique, but gets to have relations with us through our OR Tambo and the Solidarity. And this spreads to the other countries. So we then have relations between Radio Emilia, solidarity relations with Radio Emilia, with one of the Southern African countries. And then it spreads to all the Southern African countries, especially the liberation movement. And it solidifies once they get free and it begins to be focused on on South Africa. But with that, Radio Emilia begins to have relations now with Africa because we are a part and parcel of Africa now as free nations. They are no more relating with us as liberation movements, but as free nations. So that is the support you can trace it, and it's very critical, again, for our children to understand. Here is a, a region, a province, a city that is so far off from Southern Africa that begins to have such strong, sacrificial relations with Southern Africa. Probably many of them had never even visited and have not even visited even today. They don't know these people. And that is the spirit of internationalism. You give not because you know the person. You probably give even more because you don't know the person. Because you then say an injustice to one is an injustice to all. As Jose Marti says, every one of us 
must feel the pain when one is clapped on the cheek so that we can then feel that pain and do something about that. And that's what Reggio Emilia is about. Now I'm talking about the past, but you look at the present because now we suffer in Africa, different kind of suffering, poverty, ill health, illiteracy, many of these things we still suffer. So we still have people to need to feel on their cheeks the pain that the children and the people of Africa are feeling. What was your experience in Italy like and your experience with Reggio? Well, don't get me started on that one because the, 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 the experience of Italy, I must actually confess that I, come from, I came from Italy just having come from Cuba, which was a different experience because Cuba is a socialist country with its own political and social problems. Then I come to this big country with its own political, social and other problems a, a, a capitalist country, of course I come from a capitalist country. But the experience then, for me, in the first few months, I'm not able to adjust. But once I adjusted and began to understand, even the struggles that the Italian people themselves were still going through, then I begin to even understand even more the need for international solidarity and working together of those that are committed to progress and democracy because you still find those tendencies that are in Italy that are not progressive. So I adjust and I realize that there's a lot of work to do in representing my country, in promoting my country, but also in promoting Africa, because I found in Italy racism that I didn't think existed. I found people that had attitudes against immigrants, particularly African immigrants. So these are the things that then, when I start my work, I realize that I do work for my country, and that's my priority and the imperatives. But South Africa cannot be South Africa outside Africa. It is part and parcel of Africa. So whatever achievements or developments happen in, in, uh, in South Africa, they would have an impact in the whole of Africa. And whatever negative happens in Africa would have impact in South Africa. And that's what I try to promote in my work, and I must say that I did, I gave it my best shot, as I would say. Second part was working in the multilateral organizations. I'd never worked there before. And that's where Africa and the developing countries have got to make an impact. Because the poverty, the food insecurity, the land problems, when you're talking about those, you're primarily talking about Africa. And not only are you talking about Africa, which was my other area of interest, you are also talking about the African woman. Because at the bottom of the pile of poverty, of injustice, of anything negative, at the bottom is the African woman. Thanks to the history, colonialism and legacy, but also thanks to patriarchy that continues to exist uh, the world over. I begin also to do work with some of the women in Italy. Because much as Italy is a developed country, uh, and has got democracy all over these years. I find in my first six years that the women are just also at the bottom of the rank, educated or not educated. And fortunately for me, South Africa is one of those countries that is in the first three in terms of progress, women in politics, with our 48% of women ministers and our 47% of women parliamentarians, we are right at the, at, at, at the, at, at the top. And that's what other area then I try to focus on. So I enjoyed my political work in Italy. I enjoyed and I think that I increased the government uh, relations. But I also play a critical role in my view, or I choose to play this role, where I do people to people, many NGOs that I've worked with. But with Radio Emilia, I had read and read and heard a lot about Radio Emilia. So it's a city that I was very keen to uh, go to immediately. And I think the work that I've been able to do with the people of Radio, one of the things that happened is that they taught me Ubuntu because then I began to know and experience how they had been giving all these years, not for a cause that was directly theirs, but for a cause that was for humanity which is the notion, the part and parcel of Ubuntu. 
And I think that in the three and a half years that I've been here, I have been able, with my mission and those that work with me, to increase the political relations between South Africa and Italy, but particularly between South Africa and Reggio Emilia. There are delegations that I can attribute to myself that this one I invited personally to come because I wanted them to experience this. Of course, some of them, unfortunately, I must confess, they have not been able to implement some of the agreements that uh, have, have, been, have been signed. I learned a lot from the people of Regio, and as I was saying earlier on, talking to some of them, especially the Regio table, to say that I would act as an ambassador of Regio in South Africa. But Regio, of all the provinces and regions and cities I've visited, is an embodiment of Ubuntu and the international solidarity. After 35 years, what type of significance can have the link between the Regio and South Africa? I think it touches on what I've already said, that we have this relationship that started more than 35 years ago. And Regio also had a relationship that started with Africa and Mozambique even earlier. Now that is the past where they unite and they work in all fronts to make sure that apartheid is eradicated. Then we get to the present where they continue with the kind of support that we need in the reconstruction, not only of South Africa, but also for the continent. So the present, we move from the past, but we learn a lot from the past and bring it into the present, because that is the key, the internationalism, solidarity, and hatred for injustice of any kind, whether it's against women, whether it's against race, and radio, especially in the current period when I get here, is very strong on the question of human rights. And for me, that is critical because all the rights are human rights, whether it's children's rights, whether it's uh, women's rights, whether it's people of color's rights, it, you're talking about rights. So when then they take that, and I find that they focus especially on the children and the young, and that's my passion, because that then takes us to the, phase, to the, future, to the third phase, the future. It's okay, we did that struggle and everything, and we got free and we lived happily. But what about the future? Who builds a better future? It is not me, it is not some of my age group, it is not, it's not even the ones that are in their 40s, it is the younger ones. The future is theirs, but they cannot build it tomorrow. They've got to be taught today about these values, whether it's values of Ubuntu, of giving, of solidarity, of service, of not putting yourself, your self-interest. So all these values, we teach our children today so that tomorrow they are better people and they can then build a better world. Sometimes in South Africa you find that our young people are not interested in politics because they were born at the time when there was democracy, so they're enjoying everything, they've got actors and so on. They don't know it has to be defended because it is generally under threat the world over. So that's why I'm then saying that, Reggio, you see this beautiful movement of the past, the present, and the future. And underlying all that is a question of human rights and humanity. And for me, it is Ubuntu. During your mandate, you have transmitted in a very uh, deepened way to the Reggio youth the meaning of Ubuntu. Why do you believe that uh, to communicate Ubuntu to the young people is important and what are the values of this philosophy? I think I've already addressed this. The thing about it is any human being without the values of Ubuntu, of humanness, is not a human being, it's empty. And it does not matter, and I've just said this to my, to, to, to my children and grandchildren, it does not matter whether you can have possessions, wealth, all these things. It is you, and Ubuntu takes the you out. You can have all these things, but without that humanity, without that value of Ubuntu caring. And Ubuntu for us is what we're saying, I am because you are, and you are because I am. So if our children think that they are because they are, 
which means that they focus on themselves and the next person. You cannot enjoy your richness side by side with the poverty. You can enjoy, not to enjoy your, your health when you are just surrounded by people that are dying. You are going to be enjoying this walking over the corpses of other people. And these are the values that our children, because sometimes these things are explained materially. But if you explain it where you say that, you know, you can be very well, that's fine. Except that you'll be surrounded by corpses. Who are you going to be playing with when all the other children are dead? Because they cannot afford these things. So you must understand that yours is in relation to the others. I was telling somebody, they were asking me, why did I join the ANC? Because and the thing about it, I had no choice in the matter. You just have no choice in being a human being because you are born, when we are very young, when we are at birth, we are all human beings. Black, white, woman, Indian, whatever. Whatever race, when whatever nation. We are all just human beings. And you are, so you have no choice in this matter. You are born being a human. You are not born being a cat or a dog or anything. You are just a human being. And therefore, for you to continue to be a human being and enjoy your humanness, you cannot become a dog because you live amongst humans. You cannot start barking like a dog. You live amongst humans. So it's a fundamental thing for me. It's critical for young people to understand. And they sometimes don't understand because they are born into situations where they have the material. And they think everything begins and ends with material. Whereas it does not. It begins and ends with a human being and the humanness. Can you describe in a few words or with some significant work Africa today? Well, Africa today is uh, the embodiment of Ubuntu. That's what I was just talking about. And as I was saying uh, with us, is Umtu, Umtu, Gumtu, Ngabantu. You are because I am. I am because you are. And the direct translation sometimes is uh, you get your personality from the whole and the whole gets its personality from you. We need each other. We need to support each other. But in Africa, this has become so critical because over a long period of time, Africans and being and the Africanness is something that was undermined because we're being projected, whether it is in the media or in the world, we're projected as the lost cause. We're projected as the people that are either beggars, as the people that are not intelligent. You know, the projection of an African. If at all you didn't know you came from Mars and you were just told Africans are this and that, the picture would be so negative. But Africa is actually re-emerging. We are identifying, we are regaining our identity and the pride. I grew up uh, under the auspices of black consciousness, which was I'm black and I'm proud. And you actually find now that the Africans themselves are reclaiming their Africanness. And one of the things is because we are a rich continent. In fact, culture started in Africa. You've got queens and kings in Africa. You've got the beauty of Africa. I was addressing diplomacy the other day, and I was saying that one of the things that diplomacy doesn't have is the value of Africanness, because they do things in a particular way according to the book. But when you bring that value system of humanness, counter calls it humanism, we call it Ubuntu in South Africa. So. Those value systems are so free, fortunately for us as Africans, we can freely export them. We don't have, nobody has to pay for them because it's we ourselves. And what is beautiful is with the rise or the, 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 the strengthening of the AEO, that Africanness, that fundamental human value is being uh, reinserted in the way we do things as Africans. So that's what I would say about Africa, that is the growth of our value system, in addition to, of, of course, our culture. You know that as Africans, we are the most cultured, and we are the most talented. Put us anywhere, we adapt. 
as Africans. Secondly, put us anywhere. We will sing, we will dance, we will do all those things. We'll have, we'll just enjoy it. We will not be stiff, we'll just fit. And this is what the world needs because in solidarity and internationalism, I must recognize the humanness in you and take it to me. And I must recognize your best and take it. And you must recognize mine and take it. And in that way, we enjoy being human beings. Okay, have I end my visit? <laughs> have I end my dinner tonight? <laughs>